please welcome Dr. Morris talking about connections. Thank you so much, Barbara. Uh, it truly has been a journey, and a journey of connection for me since I first came here. As I listened to Marilyn Schlitz this morning, I was very struck by the synchronicity of concepts uh, between what she has to share and what I have to share, because truly it is all about the connections that we make, that we create, and that the world invites us to, to create. For me, the beginning connections came uh, in 1981 when I first came to the Monroe Institute and met Bob Monroe and was introduced through the Gateway Voyage program. This was a very powerful connection for me. I had been raised by two parents who were both scientists, and from them I learned the wonder of very linear, logical thinking, and I got very good at it. I also, however, there was a part of me deep within that was not that linear, logical person. It was somebody who often knew the answers without figuring out, you know, A, B, C, D, et cetera, and when I went into my profession as a speech-language pathologist, working with children with feeding and swallowing dysfunction, I began finding that I was working at a very different level with these kids. But I also felt I had to keep that hidden. It was not acceptable in my profession. It was not something that you talked about and yet, at the same time, I was interested and very involved in the whole brain accelerated le learning movement. In, and at a time in the, in the 70s, when people really were talking a lot about left brain and right brain kinds of information processing. But there was something about that connection that did not go deeply into who I was. And then I met Bob Monroe, and then I came here. Bob was, for me, an absolutely wonderful guide and mentor in the Gateway program, and also a number of years later when I made the decision to move from Wisconsin to Virginia and to reside here in this community here on the new land. There was a connection that came for me very profoundly, even though I had come to the Gateway program thinking it was kind of all about my wanting to understand the technology of music and sound and how Hemisync fit into that model to make learning easier for everyone. And I left with so much more because it was indeed a connection to the deepest part of who I was that very profoundly changed how I approached everything. And over the years then, began to find the connections that enabled me to live my life at a fuller and deeper level. And as I changed, my therapy with children and families became so much more meaningful to all of us. I expanded the connections then as I went back into my work. I was very astounded at, the, at the, both the depth and the breadth of what Hemisync could mean in my own life. And I wanted to see if there was a connection then to what I was doing with the children and families I was working with. And so expanded that, and that just as Bob was a friend and a mentor for me, I found myself, in a sense, taking that mentoring role into my work with families, into my work with other therapists, of helping them to absolutely know that what we were doing, first of all, was totally relationship-based, which means that it's the connection between ourselves and each other and the person that we're with that makes the most profound difference. 
But it's also then the connection of not what do I do with a child, this, this, and this, but how I do it. Where am I coming from within myself that enables that connection to become stronger, to become deeper? And so again, it was a continuation of the connections. For me, there was another very profound connection that came a year ago. I was invited to participate in some, an intensive therapy model at the Scandinavian Center of Neuromovement, which is a, a small therapy uh, center about 25 miles north of Copenhagen, Denmark, near Freudensburg. And in this uh, program, one of the things that the first thing that struck me was some of the similarities in underlying concepts between what I had learned here and what I had the opportunity to participate in there. Some of that connect, this is a program that it focuses very much on very specific type of movement learning for children with developmental disabilities, often with very complex neuromotor challenges. But the key with a lot of the movement approach is on building attention and awareness through a slow, very focused approach. In that instance, basically on how we move and on how with that kind of intentionality and attention, the brain itself changes. It maps itself differently. And therefore, children who often the world had said, yeah, there's no hope for this kid, they change. And they change very profoundly. And this is what I was finding with my work with the hemisync as well. So there was this wonderful commonality. As I was going through my slides, I was also very struck by the commonality of the rainbow over uh, the center and the rainbow over this center. So another wonderful set of connections. As part of my work at the center, I went and I teach a two-day workshop. Each time I have gone for a month on two different occasions, and I'm going back twice in the current year. I start out with teaching a two-day workshop for therapists and parents, and then continue with a period of about three weeks where I'm involved in an intensive therapy program for about 12 to 15 kids. In that program, I'm seeing the same child for about anywhere from five to 10 therapy sessions in, within the same week, often within the same two to three days. So it allows for more of a masked learning kind of an experience for both of us. I, when I was there in November, I taught a two-day workshop on music and hemisync. And everybody got very excited about looking at the hemisync, particularly from the perspective of children whom they knew and children who at that time I knew as well because I had been there last May. One of the children who I will introduce you to is Julius. And Julius is a five-year-old, and he and his mother found, and, and dad, found this incredible place in my heart. Julius is a youngster with a great many developmental challenges. He has a seizure disorder, which is his primary diagnosis. He has multiple types of seizures. He also has a lot, what we call a sensory processing, uh, disorder or difficulty in that the sensations coming in through all of his sensory channels often get overwhelming in terms of sensory overload. They often are misinterpreted. And he, in part related to the sensory processing disorder, does a great deal of moving into himself taking care of himself by moving inward. And what we see on the outside 
is often what the world can describe as more of a, uh, a social, interactive kind of a problem. Many of the things that people see and describe with children on the autistic spectrum. And I will go back to these. He has feeding and mealtime difficulties, which is sort of how he got on uh, my intensive work of looking at how children eat, but most importantly for him, how does he relate to food? How does he relate to a mealtime experience? If you think about your meals, there, uh, particularly for this little boy growing up in a family of four kids, mealtimes can be pretty loud and pretty chaotic and pretty overwhelming. And then you get all of the multiple sensory inputs from the food. And it can be a very difficult time for children with sensory kinds of issues. And as one can imagine with all of this, a lot of challenge in communication. Now, let's talk, when I look at each of these characteristics, one of the things that ties them all together is the, is the word disconnection. And so I'd like to talk a little bit about how some of that disconnect happens and why. Julius has multiple types of seizures, and this is the thing that has made it very, very difficult for him. He started out with, with what are called infantile spasms, or West syndrome, in which a child kind of jackknifes into flexion. This can happen, and it happens usually in clusters, so that a, a, he was having a lot of this kind of pattern occurring in groups of five to 10, and occurring all throughout the day uh, and throughout the night. His, a lot of this hit uh, its major bit when he was about between two and three and a half, and he was having 50, 60 seizures a day. That's a lot. That's an incredible amount. Now, if you think about the fact that when you're having a seizure, you lose information. That we can take in information, but that seizure can often wipe it out. So you become very disconnected from a lot of the things that you need in order to learn. Medication, of course, was tried tremendously with him, both medication and diet. And as he got a bit older, the seizures expanded into different types. I don't need to go into all of those types. They're called you know, myoclonic seizures and clonic tonic seizures and partial complex seizures. There are a lot of different ones. Julius has about three or four different kinds, which means that since the major approach to managing and suppressing seizures is medication, it either means you have to have be on huge number of medications and combinations of meds, or it doesn't work. It may alleviate one type of seizure, not the others, may exaggerate a third type of seizures. And so his seizures have never been able to be controlled on medication. Now, he, there also is an approach to diet that is helpful for many kids with seizures called the ketogenic diet which involves a very high amount of fat and protein, very low carbohydrates. It's very helpful for a lot of kids. Didn't do a thing for Julius. However, his family did find that when they eliminated gluten and they eliminated dairy, that his digestion got better. And over time, as that digestion improved, he the seizures went down, which was very interesting. They also tried homeopathy with him, and again, it was something that brought the seizure level down. So the seizures, when I first met him, still were quite uncontrolled, but he was only having perhaps two or three seizures a day, which for him was great. <laughs> it was much, much better. 
One of the other things that happens when your seizures are uncontrolled is that when they come on, you just fall. And so he had to wear a helmet at that time uh, to prevent self-injury. So very complex issues with a lot of implications for learning, a lot of implications for not feeling so connected with the rest of the world. Now, many of the same things can happen with a challenge of a sensory processing disorder. Disconnection, when we think of sensory processing, it's not us or them. It is a continuum. And all of us in this room experience sensory overload. All of us in this room experience sensory disorganization. What is different for each one of us is the threshold at which that occurs. You know, for example, when I was in the dining room this morning and everybody was sharing so delightedly and the noise level was up here, it's like there were points when I thought, I gotta get out of here. <laughs> My system is on such overload, I can't think. I can't process what somebody's saying to me. Now, when I went back over into the Fox's Den for the break, yeah, there were people there talking, etc. But the level and the number of people was much fewer. And so I had no problem at all. Imagine the times when you are feeling sensory overload and disorganization. What would that be like if every, almost every moment of your life was that experience? What would it be like? One of the things that we know about the sensory system is that there are certain kinds of sensory input that can be very organizing and very helpful to that system. One of them is vestibular movement, is movement through space. Another one is what we call proprioceptive and also kinesthetic move, uh, input, which is pressure or whatever into the joints and into the muscles. We also know that certain kinds of music and sound can be very helpful and very effective. And that is not so surprising when you think that anatomically and physiologically, the vestibular system for movement and the auditory system for sound and listening production are essentially the same system. It's the vestibular cochlear system in anatomy and it's the, the auditory, uh, what, auditory, I don't know, the eighth, the eighth cranial nerve uh, in terms of the neurological. So here's a little guy who has this issues, these issues with seizures. Then we add on top of it the sensory processing. And then we have the potential challenge of autism. Now, autism for Julius is an interesting question because with all of these other issues going on for him, it's very hard to say, ah, yes, this is the autism part. What we can say about him is he has a lot of autistic characteristics. Uh, and he is also the doctors and others who've seen him say, this kid is untestable. You know, how do you, how do you put a label? And one of the things that I think he is a very, very lucky little boy to be, to be growing up in Denmark, and that is that he is not dependent for educational and medical services on a label. You know, it's like, it's because of the healthcare system and the education system simply being different from what we experience here in the States, where many children aren't going to get the services they need, especially in the public schools, unless they have that label of autism. And fortunately, Julius does not have to have that. What we see that are autistic characteristics with him is the issue of sensory overload. Sensory processing issues are very, very common in children who have 
the diagnosis of autism. One of the things that is also very characteristic on many of these children is their attention and their focus is on their internal world. The external world is often very confusing. It is overwhelming. And I think they, without coming to a gateway program, uh, have the gift of being able to turn inside and to find, often find something very beautiful and very wonderful within themselves. But that very characteristic is also what disconnects them from people and from the equal wonder of what others have to offer here. And one then has difficulty with social relationships, difficulty reading people's expressions and emotions. Much of this comes from limited eye contact. You know, we, one of the things we can't do, we have eyelids. We have the ability to turn ourselves away from that sensory input. We don't have ear lids. We don't have skin lids. The eyes are one of the few things that we have that we can very systematically use to regulate the amount of input that we are comfortable with. And so many of these children have very limited eye contact, and this was a very strong characteristic of Julius. And with this, not surprisingly, reduced verbal communication skills. Now, as I look at him and as I watched him, one of the things, and this is also true for me with so many other children, what are the connections? Are each of these things something isolated or are they connected? And for me, they are very connected. Uh, there is the connection with the sensory processing, potentially affecting the seizures, definitely affecting whether a child, quote, looks and acts autistic. If there is autism, it's going to influence sensory processing. It may also influence seizures, et cetera, et cetera. And so what I'm fascinated with are the connections. And when I look at a child, one of the things that becomes very important, if I'm saying, well, where do I go? What do we, what do we need? You know, I, it's like a tree. I can look at a tree and there are all these leaves out here on the branches. And let's say there are a hundred different leaves. And let's say each of those leaves in a metaphor is, a, is one of the characteristics of this child. I can work on a hundred different things if I'm out at the peripheral leaf level. Or I can ask myself what's in the trunk and what's in the roots. What are the key issues? that if you work with that key issue or issues, is going to affect everything else. Again, the connections. And for me, the sensory processing issue was very much the key connector for Julius. In the therapy intensive that I did with him last May, um, there were a number of things that I focused on in the program. These, I was wanting to find out who is this kid? What is it that he is able to do? We also have a bias in the rehabilitation world and in the medical world for going for everything the person cannot do. Think about it, you know? It's like, what are your deficits? And then we address our treatment at the deficits. But none of us learn by constantly being reminded of what we can't do. We need to have an approach that builds and reduces those limits, but it's through the things that are working that we make the greatest gain and also that we build trust with whoever that guide or therapist or mentor happens to be. So one of the things that I incorporated throughout the sessions with him were the activities involving movement, bouncing on a ball, jumping on a trampoline, using music, dancing, all kinds of things to help his sensory system become more organized. But then doing a lot of things of instead of saying and believing that all of these, I 
one of the things I guess I didn't talk about in terms of the, the movement is this little guy had figured out some in pretty incredible ways of providing constant vestibular input to his system. His head was constantly rotating from side to side like this. He kind of flipped his fingers like so, and he had the most beautiful, graceful dance around the room. You know, much of the rest of the world would say, oh my gosh, he's stimming. You know, this is self-stimulation, we've got to get rid of it. I'm looking at him through a different set of eyes, and I'm saying, Julius, you're beautiful. You are incredible. Let's build on this. You are telling me movement is the way in for you. And what I then said is, I would like to find a way that you can know that I can help be the way out for you as well. And so one of the, one of the approaches that I often use with children is something called following, which is instead of demanding that they, enjoy, that they join my world, that I invite them to let me discover more of what their world is. So when he would do this, I would do this. And I was wanting to find out what is the fascination here? What is it? We danced together around the room. We moved our heads together. This is a kid who never looked at me, but suddenly he is going, oh, oh, who is this? And suddenly there was, it was, I think it was his understanding that he was not being judged. He was being, it was like, I wanted to know his world. And so he began to come into more eye contact, using more nonverbal communication signals, which we worked with a lot. And then in a mealtime program, as I said, mealtime was extremely difficult for him. And uh, he, often with his hands would just take the food and stuff it in his mouth, no eye contact with anyone, um, lots and lots of the movement to try to get himself organized. If his mother or dad fed him, uh, they would often scoop the food onto the spoon and hand him the spoon. He might put it in his mouth, but then the spoon would just go flying onto the floor, um, etc. And so, we worked a lot with this, and the, one of the connectors with all of these things was beginning to introduce hemisync metamusic to him. I'd like to take a short diversion, and I'm going to talk a lot about introducing hemisync, particularly to children who are nonverbal or to infants. But what I am having to say, and the essence of this applies to everyone in the room, how do we introduce this to people in a way that is at the, whatever the level is that they are ready for? And I have a handout that will be on the back table that I think, even though you're not, not working, there are only a couple of people in the room who are really working with young children, and particularly nonverbal kids, but all of us are working with the nonverbal signals of everyone around us. And I think that this you know, can be helpful for, for each of us. One of the things about introducing hemisync, I think that there have been some, I don't know if I want to call them errors or not thinking through totally the learning with it, but very often we take someone and we then introduce them but to hemisync, we give them hemisync. But we don't have a good idea of where are they starting? Where do they start? And we need to have a baseline. And so when I'm thinking about using hemisync with a child, like Julius, et cetera, when I'm thinking about using hemisync, one of the things that's very important is not to rush into it immediately, but to start with a period of time where I'm observing that individual, observing their communications, nonverbal and verbal communication signals, and getting a sense, who is this little kid, okay? I get this information from the parents, and also often will ask parents to prepare a short video at home that gives me a sense of what this kid is like in a home environment. So I think a baseline with no music at all is extremely important. And then, 
It is very important to look at the child's response to music. This is where I think we have made assumptions and potential connections that may or may not be valid. And many of these ideas have been presented in the professional seminar where a professional sits down with a client and uses Hemisync, gets a certain response, but has absolutely no idea whether they would get that same response if they had simply ocean surf or music, etc. There are thousands of well done research studies that show the power of music in making some of the exact changes, or maybe not exact, but similar changes to what we see in Hemisync. And so I think it's very important if we are saying or wanting to find out, is Hemisync effective? Does it make a difference? We need to know, does it make a bigger difference than simply using music? So I think uh, with the kids I'm working with, of more organizing kind of music. When I came back from my gateway program and was fascinated with the question of whether this was applicable to kids, there essentially were no meta music uh, tapes at that time. I had been using Stephen Halpern's uh, tape called Comfort Zone, and I talked to Bob Monroe and asked him if he could make me an experimental version of Comfort Zone. Comfort Zone was something Stephen Halpern designed primarily for accelerated learning. I was seeing wonderful responses with my kids to Comfort Zone, had been using it for years. And now the connection that came to me is, would it be more powerful if it had a bedding of binaural beats of the hemi-sync underneath it? And some of you are familiar with the informal pilot study that I did with about 25 kids during the years that I was in Madison, utilizing that kind of an introduction. Now, there are a variety of what I call organizing kinds of music, comfort zone, you know, certainly is one. One that I particularly like has been a series of recordings done by Joshua Leeds that he calls essential sound. There are a number of different levels of it, of two recordings that are called Cal essential sound calm. And he's also got a whole series of them that are for dogs and their owners. But it helps to organize and calm the system. Or also the discovery that within our realm of metamusics, there are a number of them that started out by, with composers who had released the music to the public without the hemisync and then came back here and have an embedded version. One of these is River Dawn and the other is Waves of Love, which are two that I had been using with the kids with the hemisync. Now, I want to show you, take a brief excursion here asking, is this music or is this hemisync? And let me tell you a little bit of the story of it, the beginning of it. One, I guess it was about a year and a half ago, I spent Christmas with my son and his wife and their four dogs. And it's a lively household, needless to say. Their youngest member of the dog family was about uh, three months old, a puppy. And on one particular day, one of the dogs became ill and they had to take the dog to the vet. And I became the designated dog sitter for the other three. It was chaotic. The dogs were running all over the place. They were barking. They wanted to go in the car with, you know, the others. This kept up for about 10 or 15 minutes. And I'm sitting there wondering, how am I going to get through this? <laughs> um, okay, and so this is the story. I put on, this is the kind of music that is actually, it's in part, maybe you can bring the volume up a little bit better, thanks you. 
I'd like you to notice, this is coming from my computer. This is simply music, but it's the organizing kind of music. Look at the attentive expression and then the peacefulness that emerged. This is Potima, the puppy. <laughs> now, if this had been, and this is, is, uh, uh, I forgot, puzzle. But look at the expression on the faces. And Pallas, the oldest. These animals are 100, she walks over and looks, stares at the computer. If this had been hemisync, we would have looked at it and said, oh, look at the power of hemisync. <laughs> they gathered together on the couch. <laughs> oh, I was enjoying the peace and quiet, let me tell you. Um, this puzzle again. This was a very wonderful afternoon for all of us. But again, a reminder of the power of music. <laughs> the tremendous power of music. Okay, all right. Now, we want to know about then the response to hemisync metamusic in a quiet setting, the type of metamusic. I use open speakers placed in front of or behind the children because it's a gentler approach. All of this information is in the handout. I'd rather not spend a huge amount of time with it. We want, however, the question always is, is hemisync appropriate for this child? And it is not appropriate for everyone. And I think that is very important to acknowledge. We want to observe nonverbal signals for a negative response, for a positive response, or to identify the individuals who really don't have any particular response to it or who are inconsistent. It's very important to remember that these nonverbal signals can either be very clear, very blatant, or they can be very, very subtle. And one of the things that is extremely helpful in identifying them is for us to be in a centered, attentive state because, and also to truly believe that this individual is communicating. Because if we see that person as not communicating, we will never see the signals. We will never see them. And so it, it ties in with what, how we perceive possibilities. Now, here are some of the kinds of things where a child may be saying no. Uh, fussing or crying, general irritability. Again, all of this is in the handout. Kids who put their hands over their ears, pulling on the hair or the ears, these are all signs of stress. I have not seen all of these in relationship to the hemisync, but when I see them, what I know is a kid is saying, this doesn't feel good. I don't think it fits. Some of the most ones that I have seen are a couple of kids who very actively scooted themselves away from the speakers or one little boy who took a look at me and went over and turned it off. These are very clear signals that say, no thank you, no thank you. Then we get in, potentially you also have to look at signals that we know come from the autonomic nervous system, vomiting, sweating, irregular breathing, changes in color, can be changes in coordination as well. Uh, where coordination might become less good. And then talking to the parent of a child to find out what are other things that this parent recognizes that are distress signals of that child. What are things that we see of yes, 
smiling, peaceful expressions, attentive expressions, much more sustained uh, attention to an activity, quieting, reduced agitation and hyperactivity, and kids who will move themselves directly in front of the speakers. As if they know, one little boy who did this and turned and smiled and lay down and went to sleep right in the middle of the boom box. Positive changes in muscle tone, slower, more regular breathing patterns, reduced sensory defensiveness and sensory overload is a big one. We see increased eye contact and then greater openness to new experiences, which is what has also, most of us, have described in ourselves as we listen. Our worldview gets bigger and we become potentially more open to what's going on around us. Now the question always comes up, can we use hemisync with a child with a seizure disorder? I've probably, I've worked with many, many children <coughs> who have a history of seizures and some of them controlled, some of them uncontrolled. And my, I have never, working in this kind of a very careful, very observant way, have never worked with a child where seizures have been triggered. In fact, the opposite has been the case for some children. And those are some of the kids I'm gonna be talking to you about. I think when we use it, it has to be used respectfully and with very careful observation. Now here again is just a recap of the things I was working on with Julius during uh, the May program. And when I saw him again in November, there was very definitely a change. He, the family had intermittently been using Metamusic at home, particularly at bedtime, and found that it was helpful. It was not used all the time, but somewhat randomly, which I find for someone who can benefit from it is also can be very effective. When I was first using Hemisync with kids, I was using it one hour a week, once a week in therapy, and I was seeing changes. He had a very much improved sensory processing, much more frequent eye contact and social interaction. And you'll see these as I have some slides and videos of him. Many changes with meal times. He was more focused on the food. He was much less you know, impulsive about things. He was looking at whoever it was that was feeding him when the spoon was coming toward him, and the bottom one was the fascinating one to me. There was a reduction in his seizures. He had gone from seizures that were two or three times a day to two or three times a week. Now, based on all of this, my best guess of a connection was that the Hemisync had been assisting him in getting better sensory organization and was somehow influencing the seizures. I had seen this in about three or four other children. And so I was particularly interested in that as a potential connection. And so we spent our working on all of these other things in the therapy intensive in November, but with a very strong emphasis on expanding the use of Hemisync, both its intensity, its frequency, the frequency of use, the variety of metamusics that were introduced, and then the variety of environments. This is Julius and his dad, and one of the things that we played with initially uh, all, uh, and what I use mostly is the, hemi the speakers are at a bit of a distance from the child. It's much less intense. I wanted to see, we are, one of our questions was whether he might respond to headphones. And so I use these small speakers, bringing them closer to him. Again, look at the connection. 
This is a beautiful little boy. As they came closer, he quieted. He was so attentive. He was so focused. And he was so happy. He's listening to Angel Paradise, which was one of the ones we found he really liked. This kid could be in a gateway program. You know, just look at this. This is, this is, yes, 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 yes. Go for it. And afterwards, I mean, to me, these kinds of photos are wonderful. But what's important is what happens afterwards. And he had, one of the things we were working with, they were working with at home, was with balls and with the beads that he loved, beginning to be able to be interactive with them, of taking turns, giving them to his dad. And the connection here and here is pretty awesome. Now, in the program, then, I'd like to show you a couple of short video clips to give you a sense of the, the flow and the movement aspect of all of this. Uh, when he came, in, came from the waiting room, one of, the, one of the things that had begun to happen was when he wanted to listen to this, he suddenly was pointing to his ear. And that, I mean, this was one of the first really big nonverbal signals that he gave. And I'd say, you list, you want to listen? And yes. And so um, he's really requesting the hemisync here. He comes in. You want to go over there over the other music. So I'm looking. And he looks so back at me here? and at Dad. And he's moving over to this green mat in the corner which is where we've been listening to the music. This is his dance of organization, which had also become different. It was much less stereotyped than it had been in May. OK. Um, so we come to the corner, and I have, so he has come in non-verbally, moved to the area of the room that he associates with this particular kind of music. Uh, out in the hallway, he was constantly pointing to his ear and my saying, you want to go listen to the music? <laughs> like this. Uh, here is a segment of uh, simply listening to the meta music with this kind of a speaker's up close uh, system. You may need to bring the sound really up, Sam. I'm not sure why. And again, the pointing. He is sitting quietly. He is engaged with his dad with a ball. Looks at him. Dad asks for it. We don't. I'll just do a narrative a bit with it. I don't know why the sound is so low. You know, I think so much with this is exploring our time. I talk to the parents as we're doing this, as to uh, what we're seeing, um, and so I took the dad away. Okay. How they we can use it at home? We're all of us still exploring a lot. This was the the slides was about the second session we had done. This is the last session where it was being videoed for their records. Talk to them a lot about the fact that, as Bob Monroe spoke of, hemisync is like training wheels on a bicycle. And they don't have to do this at home all the time. One of the wonderful connections I discovered was that his car seat had speakers in the headrest. I was blown away. It was a wonderful thing. And so, oh goodness, well, just watch. And maybe it's a good activity of just watching the nonverbal. One of the things that really occurred to me this morning is that 
some of his most difficult times are when you go out with him and he's in. And again, you know, with a lot noticing of does this fit for him? Uh, yes. Or when you are wanting to help. It's quiet. He's focused. There's eye nice. contact. There's interaction. Or something like that. Well, I know you like the music. <laughs> and he points to his ear and I say, yes, I know you like this. So I'm constantly giving him yeah, yeah. that feedback so that helps him say, oh, yeah, she understands that. I'll use it again when I want the music. When you're in the car, yeah. And it becomes, mm. I know you love it. I know you do. <laughs> I know you love it. Okay. Yes, exactly. Yes. Okay, I'm going to go to the next one. We... Uh, I was exploring with him some of the things where we were using the hemisync, some of the things where we weren't. Um, didn't sit there and hold this all the time. Again, one of the questions is, this is a kid who doesn't always like things around his ears, like headphones and such. So the question we were exploring here is, is there a way in which we can bring that sound up closer and more personally at times when he needs it. But also was going back, putting the speakers simply on the floor, in front of or on the side of him, and at times having the music off. So that we, it, again, it was like he doesn't have to be tethered to hemisync all the time. We were having a picnic on the floor with food and predominantly with no hemisync here. With the food, he goes back into a little bit more of his head movement and his hand gestures. But again, remember that meal times are very challenging for him. We're all of us having something to eat from this picnic. There, the hemisync is off at this point. He is when he's ready for some of the food, he stops his movement, looks what he's doing, puts it very easily into his mouth, and at times would then shift to looking at his mom or dad or me. I'm also watching him for any signs of his initiating that he wants the music. So we look for the subtle changes, even with his movements, does he stop them intermittently? Are they more varied, um, et cetera? And the answer to all of that was yes. Um, so it's the small quality of looking at the quality of what oh, he does yeah. in all of this. Oh, I know. There's your beautiful foot. There's he beautiful invites foot. me to play with his foot. Yeah. He gets a lot of eye contact with me. He often would hand me his foot when he wanted <laughs> deep pressure <laughs> stimulation. <laughs> Do you see that one? So this is what we're doing. The speakers are off, and I'm not. I think I'm going to move through this a little bit. Uh, he does point to his ear, at which point I immediately turn them back on. There always are questions of sensory choices. How do we look at choices within this kind of an environment for a child? And when does a child tell us that that's enough? You know, he loves this. But there also, for any of us, is a point where we finished with it. It's, it's, we need to move on. And it may be moving on to a different piece of music. Or it may be, I, ready to do something else. Yeah. Um, I was also using drums with him. Um, he responded very well 
went in getting more organized with just the single beat of the drum or the drum in a heartbeat type of rhythm. Toward the end of a session, he often tends to, when he's ready to move on, he escalates the movement a little bit within himself. He's, he's a child who does not make change real easily. And often as he anticipates the need for a change, he can get pretty, pretty active with things. Here comes the music again. I think this was at the point where I changed from Angel Paradise to Waves of Love, which is, yeah, this is where I'm changing it. Waves of love yeah. yesterday, which is the second one that he seems Now he like. knows it's being changed. I think he understands the words. This one. Yeah. He knows where the music's coming from. It's a different one. It's Gets himself ready. I'm going to get the music. Here it comes. Here it is. Well, this is the one that has the ocean yeah. and the dolphins. Remember? and watch his response. There's a part of him that says, yeah, I'm ready to move on to something else, but then he scoots himself back and gets himself more comfortable on my lap. Says, oh yes, thank you. <laughs> yes, it is. It is incredible. It truly is incredible. Yes. The ideas of the connection and his being a fuller participant in their family has been such a gift to all of us. One of the things that is an incredible gift for me is this family has planned a month-long time in the United States in, in April. And I, they are coming here to my home on the new land. Uh, now, he now needs, to, for about four days, he now needs to move and to dance. This now is a more active music. This is in the Essential Sound series from the set called Uplifting. Here you see mom joining him. Yes, with the following, and I join with the following as well. You know, and it's really kind of a way of celebrating and of, <laughs> he, he so often with this would do this and then he'd look at what we were doing and then he'd shift it slightly. Dad's joined us now in the following. So it becomes an inclusive activity, not exclusive. Yes. But it also may be there are times when he needs that exclusivity where he's not having to be with a person. <laughs> so of honoring whatever it is that he is saying that his system needs or that he delights in. <laughs> okay. Thank you. He's a beautiful kid. Let me, I'm going to need to move i got about five or ten more minutes, and let me kind of wrap this up. Since I have talked with his family by email um, and uh, in this last week or so, they have been using Hemisync daily at home, predominantly at bedtime, but also before meals, sometimes during meals, and very frequently during the car rides, which often were very challenging for him. One of the common things that they have said in emails all along is Julius has become such a happy child. To me, that is the essence. He has continued to grow in his focus of attention, his mealtime changes, and there has been a major reduction in seizures. For a four-month period of time, he has had almost no seizures. Wow. Now, there's another fascinating connection, you know? You look at something like this and you say, ah, yes. The weekend of March 4th, 
he had four very severe seizures. Nobody knew why. And so the question is, what's all that about? What is it about? And again, the constant invitation to grow. One of my best guesses was that it had to do with increased stress levels of their planning the trip here to the States. Ulysses does not much care for change <laughs> and, or for uncertainty. And they're bringing all four kids. It's going to be wonderful. But things are a little chaotic at home. He also, during the same time period, has lost the constant companionship of a young woman who is his helper or aide at home in their home training program and in the kindergarten. She has taken another job. So there have been some major shifts in his life. Now, this is a place that I'd like to pull this together a bit. Um, asking the questions, what is it, if anything, about Hemisync that has contributed to all of this? What are the connections? And I have a, a set of observations. One is that when Hemisync has been added, the sensory overload has been reduced and sensory processing has gotten better. Is this the connection? Is this the link? As improvement comes in sensory processing, do we have a, re we see a reduction in the uncontrolled seizure frequency. And so, again, going back to a set of proposed connections among these three areas, I have a hypothesis that I am very interested in and hopefully will be able to find the ways of checking it out. I think there are children whose seizures are triggered by sensory overload and sensory processing difficulties. Hemisync improves sensory organization and processing. I see this in child after child after child and also in my own experience. And that with better sensory processing, we probably have fewer triggers for the seizures. And that with this then, if they're not being triggered as often, this is going to affect the frequency and severity of the seizure uh, behaviors. I think it's important to emphasize we are not, I am not talking about something that cures seizures. The seizures are probably still there. We don't know how much change there actually is within the brain itself. Um, and they may reoccur in stressful situations. Again, I think Julius's seizures in the last couple of weeks have taught me a lot because they've said that, yes, there still is something there that can set them off, whether it's random or whether it's internal stress. We know from adult reports of adults who have seizures that stress is one of the big ones that can trigger, uh, trigger a seizure. But a reduction in seizures simply by reducing what sensory triggers are possible can lead to a much higher quality of life for the child and family. We could ask, are there other children like Julius? And my answer is a resounding yes. I have worked now with five of them. And all of them had similar histories of sensory processing difficulties, uncontrolled seizures, positive response to hemisync, and a correlation with a major reduction in seizures. I think all of this has led me then to the connections with thoughts about research, because I think we need research in this area. It's kind of a tickler for me. What is going on? And at, a, at an inner intuitive level and combined with external observations, I know it's making a difference. I don't have to have the research, but I want the research. You know, I want both of them. We need to, if research is done, we need to identify a population of young kids who have this combination of seizures, preferably uncontrolled ones, <clears throat> and a sensory processing disorder. They're not a huge population, so we have to look for them. 
developing a good listening protocol and identifying those kids who have a positive response to the hemi-sync and then documenting the response if you know when hemi-sync is used documenting the number of seizures for a given period of time before during and after the use of this this poses a whole bunch of challenges because it's not totally simple we don't have any research on hemisync and sensory processing we know there's no research on sensory processing and seizures we know for example that there is a category of seizures called reflex seizures where a seizure can be triggered by certain sensory inputs but it's very specific it may be light flickering at a given frequency it's not what we're talking about here we're talking about a more general thing i think that when used carefully the area of case reports is where we start of documenting this when used carefully and with good observation hemisync appears to me to be a safe effective and very inexpensive approach to helping children with sensory processing disorders, including those who have seizures. And research is very important because it could validate the use of hemisync as a non-invasive clinical tool for seizure management. We need published research for physicians to consider this as a viable adjunct to the medical management of seizures. And I think that that is so, so important. So let's continue to explore the connections and know that what we know already, these connections can make a huge difference in the lives of children and their families and in the lives of those of us who are connected to them. And I thank Bob Monroe every day for the gift that he gave, the gift of hemisync and the gift of his probably most famous statement, go inside and find out for yourself. Go find out. Thank you. Okay. <laughs>